This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Happy Aloha Friday. Welcome to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelmo. Today's program was designed with immigration and social justice reparations for indigenous peoples and specifically with Pacific Islanders in mind. Not many people around the globe, but in the US and even here in the state of Hawaii know what COFA is and why it was created. Most people are not even familiarized with the role that the US government had in the creation of COFA to repair one of the most serious social injustices against innocent peoples in the world and how contemporary social injustices continue to play an integral role and negatively impact the lives of many Kofa citizens who live in the state of Hawaii and also in other states of the United States. A lot of people do not understand why Kofa citizens are here in the US, as well as their right to be here and the sacrifices they have made and continue to make, as well as their resiliency and positive contributions to our society and country. We are fortunate to have a very special guest with us today. Joaquin Jojo Peter is a doctoral student at UH Manoa and is also the first Micronesian to serve on the Civil Rights Commission of the State of Hawaii. I have crossed paths with Jojo in my first year living in Hawaii. And in my view, Jojo is one of the most resilient Soviet leaders that our community has been gifted with. And lucky for me, I get the privilege of being his Brazilian sister. On that note, darling, welcome to our program. Thank you very much. How are Beatrice. you doing today? Good, thank you. Awesome. So, Jojo, jo, you are about to become a doctor. Do you mind telling our viewers uh, what are you going to be a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if being a, a doctor is the right word, but yeah, well, you know, I am, I've been in a PhD program at the University of Hawaii. It's a special education program. It's called Exceptionalities and for the last five, six years. So, mm -hmm. uh, like all good things, it must come to an end. And for my case, it, it takes a little longer than uh, I'd expected, but mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, it's a long process and hopefully that it, it'll come to an end soon. So. It's coming to an end soon. So what are you writing on uh, for your dissertation? Um, one of those things that really caught my eye when I first moved here, was the engagement of uh, the um, newly arrived Micronesian citizens with uh, programs here. And I think it came in uh, in 1991, at that time when uh, uh, PHH and uh, the Basic Health Away and uh, all of the other issues were going on for uh, COFA healthcare. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I wanted to look at uh, uh, you know, how Micronesian families with children with disabilities were, you know, faring in in the system and 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 living in a way. So you're basically. writing about basically education and disabilities in yep. the context of Micronesian children yep. with disabilities. And and not all, not only education because I think you know for the most part it include a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Such as? You know, such as, you know, how are they doing with, uh, you know, what are their issues and, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, where do they go to get help and uh, mm -hmm. what are the challenges and, uh, mm -hmm. and we find out that there's a lot more than, you know, just going to schools and being in uh, IEB meetings, for example, mm -hmm. and parent-teacher conferences and that there's a lot of other issues that affect uh, their outcome and the outcome of their students and uh, their children in school, for example, you know, homelessness is a major issue. Access to services, mm -hmm. um, be it uh, basic safety net, health, health uh, safety net programs, mm -hmm. um, employment, and all of the other things that everybody else was facing. But because of the special designation, their immigration uh, designation as uh, <coughs> as uh, migrants and unqualified uh, migrant migrants and aliens in the system mm -hmm. you know they have uh, limited access to those uh, so that means that really they do not qualify for public assistance for housing or uh, 
housing? Well, for housing, they're, public, they're, they're, they're qualified for housing. Okay. Um, there's no special treatment, you know, in, sure. in the way they have to, you know, uh, go about getting into public housing just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. But things like TANF for the, you know, temporary assistance for, uh, you know, food and uh, other things, uh, mm -hmm. the federal programs. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Because of the 1996 reorganization of the, the Medicaid and Medicare programs, uh, the Cuba citizens were excluded from that, mm -hmm. although they are legally present in the, in, in the nation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm as a result of the treaty called the Compact of Free Association. So, Jojo, let's talk a little bit about COFA. Mm. To our viewers who may know a little bit, or to those who have no clue of what COFA is, please explain. Well, COFA, C-O-F-A, is actually reference the treaty. It's a compact. It's called a Compact of Free Association. Freely associated states are the states, are the Micronesian nations, or states, but they're independent nations, that are under this compact treaty with the United States. All of these, you know, current nations were former territories of the United States after World War II. So when post-colonialism come to fruition for a lot of the Micronesian uh, people, I mean, uh, leaders, they started to think about ways in which they would want it, you know, in terms of their independence, you know, what it looked like. But at the same time, everyone is cognizant of the fact that the United States' interest in the island was very strong. Mm -hmm. given the World War II's ending. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the United States' vested interest uh, in those islands back in that time uh, of pre-World War II. Well, uh, at that time, you know, the United States, uh, and continues to be, uh, has a strong military, military strategic interest in, the, in, in uh, the area. If you look at the map, the area between Hawaii and uh, Japan, it's a pretty large air expense area. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they had under the trusteeship strategic agreement uh, a right of refusal, or what we call strategic denial, mm -hmm. the term that they got from, you know, through the United Nations uh, Security Council, that only the United States has access or had access to that area. So they, you know, militarily, the, basically. So they had the military then had access to the air, basically the ocean, the whole territory, and, and the whole of course, territory. yeah, that's Northern Marianas at that time. What is now the Commonwealth of uh, Northern Marianas or CNMI mm -hmm. was, you know, a district also. Mm -hmm. So you have Mar Northern Marianas is a district. Palau, mm -hmm. Yap, mm -hmm. Truck, which is Chuk, but they mm -hmm. Pompey. And Koshrai became a state much later on through some uh, arrangement, but the Marshall Islands. Yeah. So you look at Guam, which was already a territory of the United States that they had gotten from the Spanish-American War. Mm -hmm. So you have Guam on the in the in the west, and then Marshall Islands to, all the way to the Marshall Islands in the east. Then all of that area was controlled by the United States under the Strategic Trust Territory uh, Agreement. agreement. So. And they were responsible for, as part of UN's uh, um, territorial program, is to develop, you know, economically, socially, education-wise, uh, and uh, you know, and the goal be it that one day these islands must be independent. So the idea. So you have this conflicting thing where the goal is independence, but the United States must maintain its military interests. And so that was a complicated issue for the United States and for the Micronesian leaders mm -hmm. who wanted to maintain that and to balance that, you know, the, the wish for independence versus the wish for, I mean, to, to fulfill the need of the United States uh, military interests. So, in many ways, uh, if the intention was to really uh, have this fair exchange of uh, exclusivity of that uh, region for military purposes, but also in exchange to improve uh, 
people's lives and the land's abilities to be uh, self-sufficient and independent. That's a prophecy that did not really come through. Uh, the, uh, well, the, that was the that was the role that was from the trust territory period on. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the, I mean, the role under the trusteeship program mm -hmm. was to improve the lives of Micronesians, mm -hmm. and improve their education, mm -hmm. improve the social and infra, uh, economic infrastructures, mm -hmm. um, health, education. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of that, by the time the 60s and the 70s roll around, and you know, independence, I mean, post-colonialism, or you know, started happening around the world. You know, that was not. You know, oh, that was well. There's still some debate as to you know how, how, how well they fulfilled that mm -hmm. that part. Mm -hmm. So then they have to start looking at okay. So how do we move? How do they then move forward? You know, with this idea that you know there has to be some shared, continued shared responsibility mm -hmm. for the development issues. Continue to develop the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Continue to develop the education. Um, infrastructure, commerce, mm -hmm. and the other things. Yeah. And we also have to take into account how um, Kofa uh, citizens were impacted by all of the nuclear boom testing and uh, retesting in that region, uh, and how the impact of radioactive uh, exposure uh, have really negatively um, Strained and not only in the the environmental resources of these regions, but also people's health. Well, yeah, uh, and I think the the area that bears the the biggest brunt of that uh, nuclear impact is mm -hmm. the area of the Marshall Islands. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were there are still some islands there, like Bikini and <clears throat> a couple of others that are still inhabitable to this point. So it created the first ever in the, in the Pacific, mm -hmm. the nuclear nomads, people then have to be removed from that island, they can't go mm -hmm. back to it. Um, and then move to other places. Uh, some people move to, you know, move them to the mainland and other mm -hmm. other places throughout. Mm -hmm. So, but they, they're no longer in their own place. But there's also continued, you know, lingering issues about that, uh, about, uh, you know, the, the remnants of those nuclear testing, mm -hmm. the storage of the, you know, the byproducts of the nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands still. Mm -hmm. And the cleanup that is needed to make sure that those, you know, don't continue to affect the life of the the people from the Marshall Islands. Mm -hmm. And and then, of course, there is that uh, the Kwajalein Atoll in the, in the Marshall Islands that is still a military base until today. And that's an issue that the Marshallese and the United States uh, uh, leaders continue to argue over. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but if you look at the other areas, because there are so, some other islands that are within close proximity, uh, geographically, like uh, areas of other island of Pond Bay and, uh, you know, whatnot, uh, that, those other islands that if you, other people would make the, argu uh, the, the argument that the fallout you know, it needs to be re-examined quite, you know, again to mm -hmm. see the, the, the effect of, on the health of, uh, you know, of other, that uh, the other related population. Uh -huh. But I think what, what also needs to be understood is the nuclear testing uh, in, in the Marshall Islands, you know, you have to look at it as part of this larger context of how the effect of this presence and the arrangement of the trust territory, you know, uh, within that region affect, you know, the quality of uh, development, mm -hmm. for example. Um, and there were a lot of uh, United Nations reports that continue to point out at that time that the United States was not doing enough to do its role under the trusteeship agreement, the, you know, the trusteeship program. Mm -hmm to promote, you know, the economic development. Mm -hmm. And there's some books written uh, and some articles written and even reports by the United Nations visiting teams that were very critical, critical about, uh, you know, that aspect of it. So if you look at it in that broader context, 
and that all oh, well the people have been, you know, you know have been uh, supported to bring their life out of the you know World War II situation, mm -hmm. post World War II situation where I mean prosperity in 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 throughout the world is beginning to come back for you know rebuilding of Europe rebuilding of Asia and rebuilding of, and then, of course, the United States uh, economic boom in the 50s and, and the 60s, and you don't see the same thing happening in one of the areas where the United States is responsible for it. Mm -hmm. So let's take so. a quick break. On the, on the second segment, we're going to go a little bit deeper into those uh, issues, okay? Hi, I'm Ethan Elm, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. She said, all the better to see you with, my dear. That's the wolf. What are you doing? Okay, cool. Research says reading from birth accelerates the baby's brain development. And you're doing that now? Oh, yeah, ah. yeah this is the starting line. Posh. Ah. When this is over, you're dead. Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. Welcome back to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host, Beatrice Cantamo, and uh, we are here back with uh, Jojo Peters. Uh, and so, Jojo, you were talking about um, promises that were initially made and agreed upon uh, by COFA and uh, with the Compact and the United States. And how it all, you know, kind of dismantled and fell apart, and uh, the involvement of the United Nations in perhaps um, interjecting and also um, making recommendations and bringing a little bit more of accountability to the United mm -hmm. States as far as the rules that uh, should have been fulfilled back, you know, in the 50s and 60s that weren't. So. My question to you has to do with Kuliana, uh, which means in the, the state of Hawaii, the uh, privileges and the responsibilities attached to agreements and also our role, you know, in everyone's lives and in uh, situations. So, do you mind uh, talking from a COPA citizen's perspective? How is Kuliana shaping this process up in the present and not? <laughs> well, one thing, you know, during, it took 13 years for our leaders in the United States uh, leadership to work out the, a, a workable treaty that now they refer to as the Compact of Free Association. Mm -hmm. 13 Compact. years. 13 years of negotiations back and forth, what's in that, what should be out of it. Uh, the one thing that they, they agreed upon is that there needs to be continued involvement of in the economic development of the United States. Mm -hmm. So there is some financial assistance that go to, go to each one of the uh, island. three island nations. The other thing that was agreed upon is that, you know, because of this, you know, uncertainty in economic, you know, development and, and whatnot, that there has to be a safety valve for people to be able to move, you know, into the United States back and forth. That there has to be a, a, an open immigration. Mm -hmm. And to counter that, there's what the Islanders gave up and bring to the table was that they fully understand, understood at that time, and continue to do so, the need for United States military interests to be guaranteed. You know, so those were the basic principles mm -hmm. of the compact. Mm -hmm. So in exchange for 
the U.S. military military uh, presence, presence yeah. and what we call what they call shared responsibility. Mm -hmm. Is that in exchange for that, then you have you know financial assistance, mm -hmm. and then when people talk about the compact coming to an end in 2023, that's the part they're talking about those financial assistance packages. But is there a talk about also and the military presence in these no, islands? No, because so what the, way, the, way the, the, the way the agreement went is that the, the United States, as part of the compact, because a lot of the provisions of the compact will, will continue to, you know, to, to, be to, to be in effect. So the only thing that, I mean, those major parts will just dealt with the economic assistance will end. Open immigration is not part of that 2023. Mm -hmm. But again, this is a bilateral treaty. Mm -hmm. It's up to them if they wanted to put it back on the table or if they want to take a, continue to maintain it the, the way it is or mm -hmm. figure out how to make it work or, you know, I suspect that there will be a lot of discussion in the next uh, few days, few years, mm -hmm. few years leading up to that, uh, to that part. So the argument that you would have uh, in favor of keeping the economic assistance would be? Would be because there's still very little economic output. And complication with the way that the funding has been uh, has been delivered or has been allocated mm -hmm. or um, like for example in the case of the the two island nations Marshall Islands and uh, and the Federated States of Micronesia they have a commission made up of five people mm -hmm. for each separate commissions for each mm -hmm. between the FSM and the US and then the Marshall Island and the US and those two commissions they basically uh, they come together, and uh, there's like three members from the U.S. and two members from the one of the jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And they have to agree upon uh, how to spend the money mm -hmm. in different sectors, mm -hmm. education, health, you know, mm -hmm. commerce, mm -hmm. infrastructure, and you know, I don't remember the other one. But so, in other words, you're talking about equity in terms of exchange and partnership. Mm. It's not fair for military presence to continue to be a major force in these islands without also supporting uh, the socioeconomic infrastructure of the people who are also impacted mm. and are part of this process. And, and one of the arguments against that is that you don't want to militarize, you know, the whole, you know the whole agreement mm -hmm. although there can be some military support to it or if you look at it in in terms of like okay if if this if you're part of the your your share of it mm -hmm. you know continues this long then there has to be some kind of a you know but you know all of that is you know will come to the you know i i am not at all knowledgeable about what's going to happen mm -hmm. but what i wanted to get to is because a lot of these things are happening at, at the governmental level mm -hmm. You know, between government to government, and it's a complicated thing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the reason why sometimes in, in Hawaii, it's kind of hard, it's hard for the state of Hawaii to get, you know, what it wants from, you know, these things is because it's a, it's a nation to nation agreement. Mm -hmm. It's an international treaty. Mm -hmm. So the Hawaii being part of the United States, you know, and you know, it has to work through the federal government to get all of this, mm -hmm. you know, all of these things. But at the same time, what we see a lot of the people doing it on their own because of the lack of, you know, uh, like health care, proper health care, meaningful uh, work, employment. employment and education, mm -hmm. people have taken upon themselves, you know, to find that beyond the borders of their nation and utilize that open open and open and that open immigration agreement sure. so, so they travel abroad for example because health is a major issue mm -hmm. and people are, you know there's a in a lot of health problem that can not be addressed at home mm -hmm. so let's address a little bit of that that a much part of people's health issues you know from this region of the world uh, is linked also to the radioactive exposure that they 
their ancestors have had back in the days. Um, but they are here and uh, they're receiving some assistance, some health assistance. But um, is it equitable? But, is, well, there, is, there, is the access the, there? Yeah, well, the, that's, the, that's the one of the argument and was on the problem that we point to is that it was okay before, leading up to 1996, mm -hmm. because we were eligible to, uh, oh, because we come in and we work. Mm -hmm. We contribute to all of the taxes, and we contribute to the economy, and we contribute to the community and the society in general. That we are residents, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. We may not be citizens, but you know, we contribute just like everybody else. And very active, you know, in civic but, engagement. Yeah, in 1996, that major eligibility was taken away, and then that sort of precluded a lot of the Micronesians from the services that they needed, to, you know, to be able to. You know, establish themselves. You know, the first generation, mm -hmm. and you know, and uh, everything starts with foundation. If you do not uh, have good health, uh, not much in your life goes forward uh, because mm -hmm. you're walking to just basically have uh, a way to be sustainable in your own life. Mm -hmm. um, and so, health is one major mm -hmm. area of concern. Um, I know that I, I really hope that we can continue to do this and create uh, new programs where we focus specifically on uh, certain issues such as health mm -hmm. and that we can devote also a program to talk about criminal justice system and education. So um, I would like to touch base very lightly with you with regards to like and that, um, and uh, you know, unfortunately, like we, our program is coming to an end. Uh, but if you could leave a message uh, for our viewers, mm. you know, to help them, you know, be open to learn more and to revisit and to reflect uh, assumptions, great assumptions, but also understand that uh, COFA citizens are an asset to our society and uh, the, the divisions that we have, you know, need to be bridged. What would that message be? I think we need to start from the cultural perspective mm -hmm. and the fact that, you know, traditionally we've always been able to work together. Micronesians and Polynesians and the Greater Hawaii Society. Mm -hmm. I think recently the celebration of the Hokulea around the world trip, right. you know, is a really good example. And a lot of Oceanians, not just Micronesian and Polynesians, and you know, but everyone here, you know, see that as a great accomplishment and its historical roots. Mm -hmm. And that sort of points to the fact that if you, you know, put aside your differences of, you know, all of these policy differences and stuff, and start working towards integrating, incorporating, you know, inclusion mm -hmm. uh, for people, mm -hmm. that we don't continue this path down, down the, uh, you know, go, going down this path of discrimination, and that we continue to work together, to realize each other's strength and then how we can work together on those. I think, you know, <clears throat> there's so much to learn from each other. I think, um, that is just one and a very powerful example of that, uh, the Hokulea trip. I was at uh, Magic Island when the ship, I mean, the canoes came in. And just to be able to witness the pride and the uplifting of the, the Hawaiian, uh, you know, people, uh, just see and listen to the sounds and the language of, of uh, you know, empowerment. And, and it was something that it's you maybe not seen in a long, long time. Yes. And probably not for a while. And we cannot think about Hawaiian revival without uh, taking back to, you know, the amazing contributions, you know, of uh, Pacific Islanders, mm -hmm. you know, who came here yeah. with their knowledge, with their wisdom and uh, their beautiful mm -hmm. gift, uh, you know, to be a part, you know, bigger microcosm we we are in. So on that note, thank you so much for uh, being here with us. Uh, come back soon, I hope.
Thank you. And uh, thank you so much, our viewers, for uh, uh, watching us today. And I look forward uh, to seeing you again next Friday. I hope we hope.